We have a lot of uh, great content. We did have a pre-discussion uh, a few days ago, which um, we struggled to actually squeeze uh, the amount of, of time that we have with all the content here. So let's get right to it. Um, I think it'd be great to start if we could level set around the definition of alpha. Um, you know, hedge funds have had a pretty challenging backdrop really the last, let's call it 12 to 14 years, I think Art pointed out, it's been quite a period of time where, you know, we just not had that dispersion and so forth. So Mark, in, in your studies, I know you've talked about, um, you know, some of the dynamics that affect the ability to generate alpha. So could you maybe share with us some of those studies and what you've learned? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, um, you know, uh, one of the most important thing is defining alpha. Um, and I think in order to define alpha, what you really have to first come up with is what is your beta? And one of the, historically, the way people have looked at hedge fund alpha, because, I mean, when you're looking at alpha for the, you know, for a mutual fund that trades uh, large cap US stocks, it's very easy, you know, use the S&P 500 as your benchmark and, you know, you apply the formula, the alpha falls out. So when it comes to hedge fund, people didn't have an equivalent S&P 500. Um, so, um, you know, they, they thought about it and said, okay, well, uh, how about we compare one hedge fund to calculate their alpha to a group of other hedge funds doing the same thing, which is great for relative uh, performance, but it really has nothing to do with alpha. And one of the ways it fails miserably is that we know that one of the biggest drags on alpha are fees. And when you're comparing one hedge fund charging 2 20 to a group of other hedge funds uh, charging 2 and 20, you get the fee structure in the numerator and the denominator, so it falls out. So you basically, so um, in one of our earlier paper that we published in 2002, um, we just, you know, um, it was a paper introducing the concept of alternative beta, which is really um, what we thought should be the, the beta of the hedge fund. And then once we were able to actually figure out what the beta of hedge funds are, we came to the conclusion that a majority of hedge funds out there don't really have alpha to their beta, um, which is good and bad if you find the, the hedge funds that do have the alpha because they're gems to have, but you have to be pretty careful at it. Thanks, Mark. I, I know, um, and Sophie had a little bit of a, a discussion here around the erosion of alpha, right, and this regime timing component, and then how do you think about that in the concept of executing your strategy, uh, and certainly others, you know, or Jackie jump in, but I, I think you had an interesting observation on that kind of that concept of the erosion of alpha. Yeah, I think it, it partially overlaps with what Mark has just mentioned. Um, the beta and the alpha is really in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it really depends upon the starting points. When I was a quantitative equity manager, whatever we were defining as alpha would be somebody else's beta. Why? not because of something specific that we did, but because of what we were forced to do in order to generate excessive return, excess returns. And the reason was that we had been given benchmarks that were style-driven. So if you manage something against a benchmark which is growth, value, momentum, and God knows what, and you only have 3%, 4% tracking error, you will not actually go into like the most orthogonal source of return you can go you will go into something which is slightly different. So that something is slightly different for somebody else would be beta. In our case, it would be alpha, okay? What I do see through time though, because I haven't been just an equity manager, I'm more focusing on risk premium and tactical asset allocation, is that there has been a semantic drift over the years. And what used to be um, hedge fund alpha, uh, these days would be just factors that need to be neutralized in order to properly define the alpha, exactly like what Mark was, was mentioning. Something that really hasn't changed though, I mean, depending on how we want to you know, slice the pie, is the uncertainty at the end of the equation, the epsilon. Okay, so how do we split it? Is there more beta? Is there less alpha? Is there more uncertainty? And sometimes the way I tend to think of this is to say, well, if I cannot even define what my alpha is, maybe my game is not really to increase my alpha, but to, to diminish my uncertainty on the epsilon side, you know, to increase the sharp ratio. Mm -hmm. That's playing with a denominator. Thank you. Yes, yeah. honestly, that residual at the end of the alpha calculation, back in the day, that was hedge fund alpha. And then with the introduction of risk premia, better understanding around hedge fund betas, less and less of that premium remains in the classic definition. 
the reality is, from our perspective, we think there's still plenty of alpha to be had there. Uh, but it is a definition, definitional question. Um, the $4 trillion that are sitting in alternatives right now, um, it is, you know, the industry is at peak assets. But I'd argue that a sizable portion of that capital is actually managed in an alternative beta type format. All the lines are blurred. Hedge funds are running mutual funds. Mutual funds are running hedge funds type strategies. There's risk premium embedded into everything. So there's still alpha out there. It's just back in the 90s to capture that alpha, all you had to do was do convertible arbitrage or do merger arb. Today, you really have to look a little harder, and that's why Jack and I have uh, you, know, you know, a lot of job security, because finding those sources of alpha or managers who can pursue and find those alphas is harder. You need to go into niche markets. You need to go into areas that are less efficient. You need to go into places where automation hasn't yet propagated. Credit trading, for example, is still very much OTC distressed, event-driven investing, things that are more qualitatively driven and not as easy to automate, um, not to mention Bitcoin and uh, you know, crypto and lots of other uh, less efficient asset classes. So the question of um, you know, where is the hedge fund alpha, when you go back to what happened after the financial crisis and all the QE went into equity markets, uh, we had you know, more than a decade now, you know, 14, 15 years running up, up until the last couple of years, constrained volatility in rates, zero rates, you know, and, and all the money was flown into equity. So you didn't need the argument for alternatives if the only game in town was equities. But unfortunately, as we learned the hard way, you know, the policy of zero rates um, does eventually end badly. Um, it led to the uh, burst of the bond bubble. It led to the severe correction we saw in uh, tech in 2022 when NASDAQ was down 30 odd percent. Uh, it led to the burst of the bubbles in like SPACs and crypto had a few uh, meaningful booms and busts in the last couple of years. So, you know, the, the world of overly um, so much constrained volatility just gave rise to these like perverse investment behaviors. So as the world now, so, so we learned that, you know, any zero policy doesn't work zero emissions, zero COVID, zero rates, especially we already saw. But now as people are more concerned, you know, we just went through this big hiking cycle and what it means implications going forward, people are concerned about long only and all the money and flows that went into passive investments. So really the best protection from this is uh, active management. And um, when you think about, you know, what is the ultimate form of tail protection, trading, trading oriented strategies. I mean, you, you could waste money on insurance, you know, buying puts on equities, uh, uh, credit spread wideners, you could do all sorts of things, but really the best defense is a trading oriented mandate. And, um, you know, consider veering away from just a passive long only, you know, um, stay and pray, see what happens kind of thing. So I think now more than ever, uh, people are, uh, you know, interested, concerned, intrigued, looking at uh, searching for alpha opportunities um, in, in hedge funds. So the hedge fund conundrum, you know, it's, it's been, it's challenging, you know, big picture. When you look at the hedge fund indices this year, you know, through the end of Q3, a lot of the indices, the fund of funds composite and things like this are up maybe four or five, six percent tops, you know, and people are just getting a little bit frustrated thinking about, you know, why bother and you can earn five and a quarter, five and a half sometimes in cash and money market you know, some tax-free munis are paying the same thing. So, you know, the challenge is there, but you have to be more forward-looking. And that's the, uh, that's it's, the thing. It's like you're getting paid to hold an option right yeah. now. It's interesting.